If you would, take your Bibles and make your way over to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. You know, this next text of Scripture is one of those texts of Scripture that you could really have lots and lots of conversations around. Um, I think all of us at one point or another have been in those scenarios where somebody wanted to add something to what you were already doing that you thought was already right to justify, to make you believe something that you really don't believe. Um... And by the way, one thing that we were voraciously unwilling to give up in life is our opinions. You ever notice that? Um, I remember when I was first married, I lived in Lewistown, Pennsylvania, and Saturdays for one, or, were for one thing, really, I mean one thing, wash and detail the vehicle. I mean, every Saturday. I mean, bless God, I had a 1987 Ford Aerostar. Oh, Lord, if you remember those pieces of junk. Every Saturday, I washed and polished that thing and got the Q-tips out. In the, I had the best grocery getter dad van ever. I mean, I love that van, except for it hated me because the thing was always breaking down. I remember calling seven shops to uh, change a water pump on that thing. And seven shops turned me down. And finally, the last one, I said, why will nobody work on this water pump? And the last guy goes, well, it's really easy, really. He says, it's going to cost you $70 for the pump and $700 to put it in because it's just worthless. And so I I said, well, how long will it take to do it? He goes, about nine hours. I'm like, what? For a water pump? I am not a mechanic. I don't claim to be a mechanic. I despise trying to be one. But that day, I put a water pump in in nine and a half hours. Up underneath that thing. I hated that van after that. Couldn't get rid of it fast enough. But you know, the older we get, I don't really care about cleaning my vehicles that way. I don't think I've gotten a Q-tip out in 10 years to clean the air vents. You know, the older we get, we don't really necessarily care how big or nice our house is. It's just the older we get, it's now just some place that you live and have people over and sleep in, right? The size of it really doesn't matter to most of us. Positions don't matter much. You get right, you know, if you rise in the company, great. If you don't, great. I'm happy. Our, uh, you know, our needs are met. We're happy. But you know, there's one thing that we are terrible at relinquishing the older we get. The one thing that we will voraciously defend is our opinion. We won't let it go. Because we believe, no matter what, that we are right. And it doesn't matter what you think, what you believe, what your experiences are. I know what I believe, and I'm right. And I don't care if you agree with me. I know where I stand. And oftentimes, even in biblical issues, we're even more resolute. And thus we have all these denominations. We both read the same passage of Scripture. You get one thing, I get something completely opposite. But I'm right and you're wrong. How do I know? Because just I'll tell you. It's my opinion. I'm not giving it up. And it seems like this is what's been going on between the Jews and the Gentiles and those who were caught in the middle of teaching both sides over and over and over again, right? Let's look at Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, then we're going to start breaking it down here. It says, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to, up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria describing the conversation of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, 
and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you begin to realize that right off the bat, they're adding things to salvation. They cannot be saved unless the rules and the regulations and the guidelines were held firmly in place. Why? Because that was their belief. That was their opinion. That's what they had experienced. That's what they had to force on everybody. But be careful when we begin to force our beliefs that are extra biblical onto someone else. We need to be careful of that. Um, I think many of us may have grown up in portions of that put upon us in, in our early days, and we need to be careful about doing that, adding to the Scripture. Uh, let's just take a moment and pray and ask God to work in our message. Lord, as we come before you once again, I pray, dear Father, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts from your word. I ask, dear Father, Lord, that you would um, Lord, teach us those things that we need to know. And uh, I pray, dear Father, Lord, that you would just allow us to be honest in our walk with you, Lord. And Lord, to truly put our faith and trust in you in an authentic, genuine way, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, I apologize in advance. My insulin pump thing fell off my side right before the service. And now it's going to beep and drive Cheryl nuts through the entire service. I'm sorry. Uh, apologize. Um, so notice the, 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 the disagreement. It says you cannot be saved unless you have been circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Period. You know, what they were saying in essence was this. A Gentile had to become a Jew before he could become a Christian. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, you have to be circumcised as a Jew, become a Jew, follow all these rules, regulations, and the law, and then maybe you can become a Christian if you're lucky. So the stipulation was put on them to have become a Jew before they could become a Christian. But here's the thing. Anytime that you add to salvation, I'm just letting you know, Satan will have a heyday with that. He'll have a heyday with that. And I believe he did in this scenario. Uh, this thinking says that simply trusting Jesus is not enough. It's not enough. And this is adding to what the Bible states as to how one is saved. And essentially, it becomes salvation by works. And we know that is unbiblical and is not what God has established. I, I think about this a lot because it is near and dear to my, me and my circumstances and my experiences growing up. Oftentimes, as a, as a kid in our youth group, it didn't really matter where your heart was as long as you looked good. I mean, your hair was cut just right. It wasn't long because if it touched your ears, that meant you were sinful and rebellious, and somehow you had a wicked heart. That just is what it is. And it was, it was so pushed on you that, that I can remember trying to walk out of the house, and, and, and it was so, and I don't know if it was more pressure from the church or from the parents who were wanting to be, you know, not wanting to be pressured by other parents at the church. But we had these rules and regulations that you had to follow, and one of them was that you had to have shaved heads as a kid. Because, bless God, if one hair touched an ear, you're rebellious. It was, re, it, was, it was a rule that would add, it was added to our Christianity to make you accepted. Clothing. I remember, I, uh, my mom is going to laugh if she watches this. I remember I almost got to church one day without a pair of socks on. I almost got there. We got three quarters of the way to church and my mom looked down in the passenger seat and she goes, where are your socks? It's 95 degrees out. I was wearing pants. I had a nice collared shirt on, but I didn't have socks on. She whooped that car around, went right back, because, uh, bless God, there was an expectation. You go to church, you give God your best. You wear the best. You can't wear shorts to church. I remember I almost got to church with a pair of jeans on once. I literally, I got almost all the way there. We got to just the entrance of the church parking lot, and all of a sudden my mom looked in the back seat and saw that I was wearing jeans. She whooped that car around, went back. She goes, you get in there, young man, change those jeans. You are not wearing jeans at church. Anybody remember those days? My goodness, it was real. My mom, I, I mouthed off once. I got the ear. Anybody ever had the ear twist? Oh, my word. That is the worst punishment on the face of God's earth. That's worse than waterboarding. I mean, what? Oh, man, that was bad. Man, she caught me in a pair of jeans going to church. I, I remember once I, I brought a new King James to church. Lord have mercy, that was like the, 
That was just sinful, rebellious, and is of the devil himself. Because it wasn't King James. And you know, if you're not saved from a King James, you're not really saved. I heard those things growing up. There are rules and regulations that if you wanted to be quote-unquote right with God, and if you wanted to really be in fellowship with Him, you had to follow all the rules and the regulations. Going to movies. I was never allowed. How many were never allowed to go to a movie growing up? Yeah, about a third of you. I, I, that was of the devil himself. You might as well have just said, the devil, hey, come with me. Let's go. We're going to go have some fun. That was, but, but you know, we had Blockbuster. I couldn't go to a movie because you know, it was a poor testimony of you didn't know what people, people might think you're going to watch the wrong thing. There's four movies to choose from. I go to Blockbuster, there's 4,000. But that blockbuster wasn't taboo and it wasn't of the devil. That was okay. But the movie, you're supporting Hollywood. Oh, my goodness. Rules and regulations. And I remember thinking as a kid, and I've said this many times, I felt like God was just right there with his thumb, just just go go ahead, do that. (laughs) You know, just waiting to snuff me out if I just dare step in the wrong direction. I lived in fear and trepidation as a teenager. Just thinking. I remember thinking very clearly, if I do this, God's not going to let me get married. And if God doesn't let me get married, then if I do it again, then he's not going to let me have kids. And if I do this again and God doesn't let me have kids, then he's probably going to give me something that has special needs and I won't be able to know what to do with it. I mean, I just had all these, all these fears and phobias that if I didn't follow all the rules and you know, abide by every regulation, I just could never measure up. You can't live that life. Nobody can. And sometimes we put those on our kids because it's going to help them. Trust me, your kids are going to find a way to do what they want to do. They will. Anybody understand what I'm saying? They will find a way to do what they want to do. And you may or may not know about it. There is things that we were reading here. So all of a sudden, these, as it says, a certain men came down from Judea and taught the, the, taught the brethren. Well, first of all, these men were teaching those who were saved, believers, says that because that's brethren. It says, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there is a huge discrepancy here. There's this disagreement. And Satan is having a heyday because it's no longer enough just to trust Jesus by faith. You have to become a Jew, and then be, in order for to be saved as a Gentile, then you can become a Christian. Satan was having a heyday. And this, folks, is nothing more than legalism. That's all it is. Let me give you a couple of verses. In Romans 11, verse 16, it says, or Romans 11, verse 6 says, And if by grace, then it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If I have to add to the salvation, or, or add to my faith in order to be saved, it's no longer grace. He says, for you are saved by grace, right? So if, I, if it's according to my works, it's no longer grace. But if it's of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. He said the bottom line is you can't be saved by both sides. You can't. It's either one or the other. And if you're trying to add what Jesus has already established as a means to salvation, you're adding to it. And it's a different gospel, according to Paul in the book of Galatians. It's a different gospel. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So he says, you can be circumcised, but that's not what is going to justify you. It doesn't work that way. He says, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He is very clear in this fact. He says, you cannot Follow the law. You cannot cross all your T's. You cannot dot all your I's. You cannot live by every established rule there is and expect to somehow be justified. You can't do it. Because once again, if that is your motive of operation, or mode of operation, Christ died in vain. He literally did not have to do it if you can do it apart from that. If you can be so good, and yet here's the problem. He says if you offend in one point, you're guilty of what? Because you're no longer perfect. You can't do it. None of us can. 
And then he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, no flesh shall be justified. So he just lays it out just as clear and as plain as day. No righteousness comes through the law. You can't be righteous enough just because you may be a good person, just because you may follow all the rules, just because you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's, does not mean that you are righteous. One of the things my wife has said, and I never forgot, she said, growing up as a kid in that environment, as, as did my wife, as very similar to mine, you, woke up, you, you, know, you grow up in this, and it's like, as long as you look good on the outside, you were good, man. You were good. I mean, I could come to church every week carrying my Bible in hand. How you doing? Wonderful. How's, how's your walk with Jesus? Wonderful. Because I look good. And as long as I, you know, in our circles, grew up wearing nice clothes and a tie on Sunday, and as long as you're a woman and starting at two years old wore a dress on Sunday, you were good. It didn't matter where your heart was. You looked good. We forget that God wants to see our hearts. It says man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. Where is your heart? See, here's the thing about outward appearance. We can be deceptive. It can look like everything is perfect. I listened to a testimony yesterday uh, that was really interesting. It talked about a guy who was addicted to uh, drugs and alcohol. And I listened to his uh, whole testimony for about 30 minutes, and I, I was teary-eyed when I got done listening to it because it was just so powerful to hear this man. He says, my biggest problem as an alcoholic was that I tried to deceive everybody. He goes, I would literally say to everyone, no, I'm good. Well, how many beers have you had? Oh, just, just a couple. You know, and everyone knew the truth, but you try to hide it, and you try to deceive everybody, and you try to make everybody think that this is the reality, when, and when in fact, this is the reality. And he says, you know, as I was getting better, you know, as I was telling everybody how much better I was getting, he goes, I used to buy a, a, you know, a six-pack of near beer, you know, you know, with a fake beer, you know. It kind of has a little bit of a flavor. He goes, I used to take the covers off, dump them all out, then go buy a, pa- a pack of bush, put them all in there, and then put the covers back on. And everyone thought I was drinking the near beer. He goes, I, was t- I worked desperately hard. He goes, I tried to deceive everybody. And, you know, the problem is that you can deceive a lot of people and think that you're doing better than you are. But the reality is, where's the heart? God is interested in the heart. And I found in my lifetime that I can make a lot of people think I'm doing wonderful. Someone said the other day, well, how are you feeling, Pastor Ken? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And then a little bit later, they're on the phone. I think you was hurting a little bit. Yeah, I was hurting. Oh, most people don't know it, but you can hide it. Anybody ever tried to hide things? I mean, you don't want to tell somebody that you got an addiction to pornography. You can hide that. You don't want to tell anybody that you got, you know, problem gambling. You're going to hide that. Look good. Come to church. Bring my Bible. Have some spiritual conversations that are biblically based in nature. Hide it. Make everyone think everything's good. The problem with trying to keep all the rules and regulations that is even if you think you are, you're not. It's a struggle. And then you have to begin to tell lies, and then you can't remember who you told the lies to and which ones you have to cover, so you have to make more. It's hard. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, no flesh will be justified. He says, if it's through this law, he goes, I will never, ever be justified. In verses 2 through 5, you see his defense. And they're very clear about this defense. In verse 2, he says this. If I can find verse 2, it's blending. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the hub. I mean, all the lead church leaders were there in Jerusalem. We have to go get official word from those to make sure that we're on the right track here to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Hmm. So the reality is, I don't think they were buying the addition to salvation and trust. 
And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they report all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So even from verse 1 to verse 5, there's a little bit of a distinction. Those in verse 1 were saying, you have to be circumcised for salvation. But then in verse 5, these guys, these Pharisees say, well, wait, I'm not necessarily have to say you have to be circumcised to be saved, but you do have to keep the law of Moses. I mean, it's important that you keep the law. So once again, it was still in addition to what God's Word had already said. And you know, in verse 3 of the book of Jude, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. He says, listen, we need to stand up for the truth of this. And the truth is that you, is, you cannot be justified in and of your own selves. You can't be justified by keeping the laws, the rules, the regulations. You can't do it. And if you think about it, God's word is very clear as to why he gave us the law. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 through 26, it says, therefore the law was our tutor. In some of your translations, it may say schoolmaster. So in other words, it was our teacher to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor, under the schoolmaster, under the teacher. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So he said, what does this realize? So as we look at all the law and all the rules, the regulations, you realize that you come to this one conclusion. You cannot be good enough to keep all of them in and of yourselves. You can't. And God's words, once again, makes it clear that if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all of them because you're no longer perfect. You know, I, I used to think about this in terms of bloodlines. You know, it's an amazing thing. I love boxers. We're, we're a boxer family. We've had, we're have we on our third boxer. Um, Patches is the best one because she's mine. Um, she's just awesome. She's my, she's my friend. And uh, she doesn't talk back most of the time. Uh, she's no, I was kidding. She's wonderful. I love my boxer. She's just got a little baby. But you know, she's a purebred. What makes her a purebred? Well, her mom and dad were both purebreds, and their mom and dads were purebreds, and their mom and dads were. It makes them purebreds, right? But what would happen if I bred my boxer with a Doberman Pinscher? Would it still be a pure breed? No. And forever, that offspring will never be pure again. What happens if I take that, off or, or that, that offspring and I breed it with another boxer, and then another boxer, and then another boxer, and keep doing that for, forever and ever and ever? Will I ever get that purity back that's lost? No. Because once you breed it with something that's not purebred, it's no longer a purebred. That whole entire line, that's sin. Sin came into the world and everybody has sinned. There are no longer any pure people. We are only pure because of Christ justifying us just as if I'd never sinned as he cleanses us with his blood, right? Unworthy yet made worthy through the blood, as we say. But when it comes to the reality of if you're offending one point, you're guilty of all of it because you're no longer perfect. You can't become perfect because you've already, you're already flawed. So he makes it very clear. The schoolmaster was there as for a purpose and for a reason to help you to understand that you cannot keep the law perfectly. None of us can. There was only one perfect person, that was Jesus. So the gospel is accepted by faith for all men. We see this in verse 6 and 7. It says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth of the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He says the gospel that's going to change their life comes through believing him. And last week we looked at what the gospel was, the fact that he came down, was buried, died, that he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, right? And we talked about the fact that we shouldn't be ashamed of that because it is the power of God and his salvation to everyone who believes. And so the reality is he says, he came and he chose amongst us that even the Gentiles should be saved by their belief in me. So it's not with, about the law. It's not about keeping all the rules and the regulations. It's all about my faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. 
Remember back a few months ago when we were in Acts chapter 11. It says in verse 17 and 18, If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? <laughs> and when they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying that God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Here's the thing. God didn't make them jump through hoops to come to saving faith. How many are thankful for that? Get rid of all your sin, then I'll maybe consider it. Get rid of that addiction, and maybe I'll let you come be one of my children. Quit doing that irritating thievery, and, and, and then I'll let you be saved. Who of us could make ourselves good enough, pure enough, holy enough, righteous enough, sinless enough to demand our way into heaven? None of us. Can't be done. He didn't make the Gentiles. He said, listen, the bottom line is, he goes, if the Gentiles are going to listen, he goes, I'm going to use you as a person to be an instrument to me to bring the Gentiles to Christ. And he didn't make them jump through hoops to do it. And I'm so thankful for that because I'm not a very good jump through hoop person. I just can't do it. How many, how many are like, don't like to be put in a box of things? You guys are a bunch of liars, three of you. I mean, you like authority? You like someone telling you what to do? Let me rephrase that. How many of you don't like people telling you what to do? Sticking, thank you. So now some of you, a couple more. Some of you can repent later. Um, I'm just telling you, I'm not a type of person that can try to be put in a box. My flesh is way, way too powerful for that, strong for that. Someone says, well, you're, you're a pastor. I mean, you say, yeah, I do. But if I lived in my office, I would go stir crazy. When I was a junior high teacher at a, at a, at a school in Pennsylvania, I negotiated with the principal to get out of the classroom. I could not stand being in that classroom all day long. Four walls. Give me the biggest room that has the most windows because, squirrel, I need that. Don't put me in a box. They're putting God in a box. They're saying, you got to do this or you can't be saved. And he says, wait a minute. I'm not making them jump through hoops because they want to put their faith in Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. So there's no distinction in the eyes of God once you have the Holy Spirit in you. Isn't that an amazing thing that he will offer his Spirit to anyone who will put their faith and trust in him? Isn't that amazing? We're talking about the God who changes lives. Where you're at when you're willing to repent, and confess and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. That salvation is for anyone who will believe. Anyone. And he doesn't make you jump through the hoops and get perfect first. In fact, you can't. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I had someone come to me one time and says, Pastor, I just don't know if I'm saved. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I just don't know if I'm saved. I kind of facetiously said, why do you care? Well, oh, <laughs> the fact that you care about it and that you want to live righteously for the Lord says something. If you didn't care, you wouldn't be thinking about it. Now, I did go back and clarify all that, just so you know. We gave some more verses and direction after that. But that response was to make you think that you wouldn't care if you weren't saved if you didn't have the Spirit living within you. But he gives us our spirit so that he bears witness with his spirit that we are his. Why is it that you feel conviction of sin? Because his spirit is within you saying that's wrong and you need to listen to it. How do you know that when you're, when you're thinking about contemplating about doing something, you, maybe you haven't even done it yet, but you're contemplating, is there that still small voice that says, ah, I don't know if that's the best choice. That's the spirit. Saying, don't do it. His spirit is bearing witness with our spirit, with our spirit, right? You need to listen to it. But he goes on to say in Acts chapter 15, verse 9, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He says, once you have the spirit, there is, hey, listen, you may have been circumcised. You may not have been circumcised. But there's no distinction to those that have my Holy Spirit within them. You, you were, you weren't doesn't matter but it's not required the gospel is accepted by faith and not by works 
How do I know that? God's word is very clear. Uh, look at verse 9 here, once again, as then we go into verse 10. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So he talked about them very clearly. He says, you're putting a yoke of bondage. What was the yoke of bondage? Making them have to be circumcised. Making them have to follow the law explicitly. He says that was a yoke of bondage. Why? Because you can't bear it. You can't. And that's where we were talking about Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And what is the result of this? Matthew chapter 23, verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So we're going to put these, you know, I'm better than you. I'm a Jew who is circumcised, and I'm better than you because you haven't done this. I'm going to put this bondage upon you, this yoke that you cannot bear until you become as good as me. Folks, that's just deceitfulness. That's heresy. That's legalism, and it has never worked, and it will never work. So the end is that we will be saved as they are. Look at verse 11, this last verse here. It says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, be, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, if I were writing that, I would say they would be saved just like me. Why? Because I'm saved by putting my faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has indwelled me. But to prove the point, he says, we'll be saved just like them. You, you think you're the only ones that are going to be saved? Nope. We're going to be saved just like them. Gentiles are going to be saved just like those people. And how is that done? Through faith. So well, what does that mean for all of us? You can know Jesus. And God doesn't call you to be perfect. There's nothing that you've done that's so great, that is so difficult, that is so wrong that God can't forgive you, that God can't save you. Isn't that amazing? That God is a God of second, third, 75th, 110 million chances. I love that. I, to me, if you ask what, I, what is my most coveted attribute of God, it's forgiveness. I just look at my own life and I say, man, I am worthless. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything good. You say, you're just being No, I, I believe that. I believe in God's word when he says that all your righteousness are as filthy rags. That's what it, they are. If I got what I deserved, I'd be in eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. And every day I get to experience God's mercy and his grace. Every single day. Don't ask me why, but I saw this, once again, this link on Facebook, and it went to a section of Philadelphia where there's like six city blocks of just people who live on the streets. I mean, the camera guy that was, was spanning the sidewalk, I mean, there was, I mean, you couldn't go three foot without seeing ten needles. Literally. And he's walking block after block, and just, I mean, piles of needle. People are just out in the left field, just, uh, you know, not, they don't have a clue what's going on around them. Someone could just go, and they blow over, and I mean, they're just out of it. Six blocks of just nothing but drug addicts, alcoholics, and people who are about 3% alive. If someone just kind of look at them wrong, they probably fall over dead. And I think to myself, wow, I, I can't imagine being that overwhelmed with sin, the, sinful, the sinfulness of that addiction, and at the same time being so blessed by a God who has chosen to allow us as mankind to be a part of his family. They say, well, choices have consequences. Absolutely, nobody's denying that. But do you realize that apart from God's grace, we could be just like that? That we could maybe not be the addicts, but be atheists, or those who reject God, or those who are trying to be super righteous and come to Jesus in our own terms, our own ways. I'm so thankful that God forgave me, and that he gave me salvation. 
that he gave me hope. I'm awestruck over that. He says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Think about that. I believe. Yeah, lots of us believe. But here's a question. God's word says the devils believe and tremble. What does your belief drive you to do? Does it produce an action? I believe, so therefore I will live for him. Or have we forgot the awe? Have we forgot what it means that Jesus saved us? The fact that if you've ever read the sinners in the hands of an angry God, when you think of God dangling us out over, over the lake of fire for all eternity, he says, but in grace he extended mercy to us and offers us salvation. That's powerful. And apart from that grace, that mercy, we'd all be in hell. That's powerful. And have we come to that place where we realize that I'm a sinner and Christ died for my sins and I need to seek His forgiveness. I need to repent. And let it change the way you live. It says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made. Why, why does he say the mouth? Can I, just, can I just say a silent prayer in my, in my mind? Lord, um, and just silently pray? Yeah, you can. But there's something about mouthing and not being ashamed, and I don't care who knows it, that I'm a follower of Jesus. Remember, we talked about that last week. He says, if you're ashamed of me, he goes, I'll be also ashamed of you at, at, the, at the return. Ouch! That's harsh! As I said before, that's the red words. That's Jesus said that. I didn't make that up. He says, if you're ashamed of me, he goes, I'll be ashamed of you. So he says, there's a, there's a reality of, I can say I believe, but with the mouth, confession is made. Am I willing to say publicly, Lord, Lord I, I believe, and I'm not ashamed of it. This is for the Scripture says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. There's that shame word again. He says, if you will believe, he goes, you'll not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I just say, He is such a merciful God. And if you don't know Him, that's the greatest decision you could ever make. And I'm here to tell you today, he says, just in simple faith, trust me. I'm not asking you to get rid of all your sinfulness. I'm not asking you to stop smoking your cigarettes. <laughs> I'm not asking you to quit drinking. I'm not asking you to stop carousing. He says, let's get down to the heart of the matter first. I just need to know you first. I want to know you. And here's the thing, when you give your life to God, He'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of it. But it starts with us making a step of faith saying, God, I want to know you. I want to know the God who loved me so much that He would send His Son to die on a cross for me. Oh, I don't deserve it, but I'm grateful for it. So He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God had raised Him from the dead, and he says, with a heart one believes, but with a mouth confession is made. Are you willing to confess the Lord, to the Lord Jesus how much you need him? And to put your faith and trust in him, to know him today. And I'm telling you, if that is genuine, it changes everything. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you think. It changes your eternal destiny. If that faith is genuine. Lord, as we come before you this morning, I ask dear Father, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. I ask dear Father, Lord, if there be one here today, Lord, that does not know you as your Savior, Lord, I pray, God, that you would remove every excuse, every reason, Lord, why they would say, I don't want to get saved today. Lord, I pray that you help, if there be one here, Lord, that does not know you, might today be their day of salvation. Lord, might today they realize that they don't have to change and get everything perfectly in order before they can come to Christ. 
but God, that you'll forgive any sin. I ask, dear Father God, that you would just draw them to yourself today. And Lord, for many who have maybe made a profession years and years ago, but it has not changed the way they live, I ask, dear Father, Lord, that they would contemplate whether or not they truly know you, whether or not their spirit is truly within them, bearing witness with your spirit that they're yours. I ask, dear Father, Lord, that you would bring salvation to those who need it today. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just ask for a moment that no one be looking around. I ask that if you know Jesus, that you'd be praying with me this morning. And the question is this, do you know Jesus? Do you truly know Jesus? Not do you know about Jesus, not do you attend church, not do you help with projects, not do you give to the poor, not are you a good person, but you do you truly know Jesus? Has Jesus changed your life? And this morning we realize that you can go to a church, you can give, you can do whatever you want. People can add to the faith, but it comes down to simple faith. Do you believe? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Because he says, for with a heart one believes, but with a mouth confession is made. Are you willing to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. Thank you for your shed blood. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Ken, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I truly know Jesus. Listen, I'll never embarrass you. I'll never call you out. But if you're concerned this morning, could I ask you to take a step of faith and a step of boldness? Could I ask you to have courage and just look at me? I'm not embarrassed you. I'll call you just so I can pray for you. Just simply look at my eye. If you don't know Jesus, I would love nothing more than to pray with you. Will you just look at me? Do you know him? Are you truly saved? Do you know that if you were to die today, that you'd spend eternity in heaven? Do you know him? If you're not sure, just look at me so I can pray for you. Then the second question is this. Has he changed the way you live? I mean, have you lost your sense of urgency? Have you lost your zeal and excitement for walking with Jesus? Have you become shy and overwhelmed about talking about him in public? Have you stopped sharing him with your friends, neighbors, coworkers, loved ones? Has he changed the way you live? Because he's real? Hopefully we've never lost the joy of knowing Jesus. Say, Pastor Ken, if I'm honest with myself this morning, some of that joy is dissipated. I don't doubt my salvation, but I've lost the joy of knowing him. I've lost the sense of urgency. Can I remind you, James tells us that him that knows to do good that doesn't do it is sin. There's joy in knowing Jesus. Say, Pastor Ken, I'm struggling with that. My walk with Jesus has become very casual, almost cold. Anyone else say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm struggling in that area. Yes, yes, in the back, in the front. Just take a moment right there where you're at and say, God, renew. You know, you know what David said? David struggled with after some areas of sinfulness in his life. He said, I felt like I'd gone distant from God. I felt like God wasn't near me. He said, I felt like my bones would be ever beginning to wax old. And then he just simply said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. I think that's where it starts. God, I acknowledge that my walk isn't where it should be. My obedience maybe is not where it ought to be. But God, please forgive me. And he will, because he says in 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive and he does forgive. So just start there. God, forgive me. Cleanse my heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. That's what David said. And as he did that, God began to re- revolutionize his life. Lord, I pray that you be with each one who raised their hand their heart towards you this morning. Lord, I pray that, that those who want to see your face, 
that those who want to feel your presence, Lord, that you would allow them that this week. Lord God, that they may know that you're with them, that you're encouraging them, that you're strengthening them, that you're renewing their minds and their their efforts, Lord, to walk with you, that you would bless their endeavors. I ask, dear Father, Lord, for each one who raised their hand, their heart towards you this morning, Lord, that you'd put within their heart a desire to spend time with you, to walk with you, to grow in you. Lord, I need that. I think we all need that. Lord, there's times of drought, it seems like. And yet, Lord, we need to come back to the living water. And Lord, I pray that you just help us, Lord. Put that desire within us daily, hourly, Lord, to think upon you, Lord, and to know that you're there with us. So, Lord, do a work that only you can do in our lives. Lord, be with each one that's here today, Lord, that all of us, Lord, would be careful, Lord, to not allow our selfishness to get in the way, our flesh to get in the way of our walk with you and our time with you. So, Lord, we pray for your help. Lord, we cannot do this apart from your spirit. Our flesh is just way too strong. Our desires apart from you, Lord, are just way too strong, Lord, in other directions. So, Lord, we need you. We confess, Lord, we cannot do this without you. So help us, we pray this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.